Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production of this program is made possible in part by a grant from E and J Gallo Winery. Welcome to Valley's Gold, where we're going to take a look at the economic engine that drives this region, agriculture. My name is Ryan Jacobson, and I'm your host. Today we're going to look at a Central Valley legacy, figs. We're going to visit a farmer in his orchard, learn more about the rich California fig history, go to a processing facility, and finish off in the kitchen. So join me as we talk all things figs. We're in Madeira today at the Specialty Crop Company talking figs. And with us, I have owner Kevin Herman. Kevin, thanks for having me out today. My pleasure. We're here to talk about figs. I don't know a whole lot about figs, so you're going to be my answer guy for this. Okay. Uh, let's begin with, um, there's, there's essentially two types that most people are probably pretty familiar with. We have the processing side, and then we have the fresh fig, which has really gained some popularity the last couple years. Um, talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, dried figs have been around forever. and. Uh, the main reason for that is because they're, they're not perishable. They'll hold up for a long time in storage. Uh, but now with everybody in the new cooking trends being the way they are, uh, things like fresh figs are becoming more popular and uh, they have an entirely different taste than a, a dried fig would have. And, uh, we've got a lot of different varieties, so you get a lot of different flavors, different colors and textures and consistencies. And uh, those are the things that are driving the fresh fig market right now. Now talk a little bit about your family history. Is uh, figs ran in the family for a lot of years or is this something you've just started yourself? Uh, I'm a third generation farmer, uh, but uh, figs is something that's, that's new to uh, our family with starting with me. Uh, we came from a raisin growing background and uh, had a chance to diversify and get into some unique crops like figs. That's why we call ourselves the specialty crop company. We want to focus on specialty crops like figs and uh, so far it's working out pretty well. And that's one thing about figs is that even though it has a lot of recognition here locally, there's not a whole lot of acres of figs left in the state of California. Uh, you were saying earlier approximately 9,000 acres? Yeah, that's that, a, that we're down to about 9,000 acres and uh, uh, primarily uh, we've always made a little bit of money on figs but uh, not, they have not been nearly as profitable as things like almonds and pistachios have been. So uh, with, with land prices the way they are, we've been uh, transitioning some of our figs into those more profitable crops. Uh, but now the prices are starting to come up on figs, especially on fresh. And uh, there's a little bit of a renaissance starting to occur on, on, on the fig industry. I, I think you'll see our acreage start to slowly increase over the next four or five years or so. I've definitely noticed that. There's been a lot of excitement about figs probably the last decade. We've seen a lot of that and we know there's a lot. The fig festival every year has yep. gained a lot of popularity and we've seen a lot of cooking demonstrations and everything else. So a lot of excitement about figs. Now the really one thing I wanted to focus on today out here in the field is figs uh, grow a little bit differently than some other crops and that's kind of the unique thing about them and the fun thing about them. They're really tied to the history of the San Joaquin Valley. Let's talk about what we're, we're standing out here in the field. Let's talk about these trees we have around us. What variety and what they're going to be used for. Okay. This this uh, is a relatively young ranch. It's about uh, five years old. They're called Sierras. And uh, the main old guard variety that most people are fami familiar with is uh, the Calamerna fig. And uh, they're low yielding. Uh, they need to be pollinated. And, and, and it's just, we're not making any money farming them. So this is an attempt by UC Davis to uh, try to get a, a replacement for that variety. And uh, we, we, we're excited about it. We, uh, we think it's, it's going to do well in the future. Uh, we can market them fresh or dried both. And uh, it creates a lot of flexibility for us. And uh, we're excited about them. And we got actually a sample right here of this fresh one right here. Mm -hmm. You were telling me you could actually go through this field four times to harvest this. Yes. Uh, figs are different than almonds because they don't ripen up all at once. So we have to let the uh, fruit fall naturally. Although we have a wind machine that comes along that if there's fruit that's semi-dry, it'll help knock it off the tree so we get it up and out of the orchard. But uh, we have to do four separate pickings, so it's, it's real time consuming. And, and the fruit, uh, every day, you'll, you'll find uh, another fig somewhere on that tree that, that's ripe. So we literally have crews seven days a week walking through the orchard picking for fresh. And then the fruit that we don't pick for fresh, uh, we, we sweep up for, for dried figs about once every seven to 10 days. That's the fun thing is there's no waste. So uh, let's begin with now these trees that you said about five years old. Uh, first off, I mean, I see the irrigation. One thing that figs are known for is that 
they, they're irrigated a little bit differently than a lot of other types of trees that are out there. If you can talk on that. Sure. Uh, figs do not like high humidity in the uh, late growing season in July and August and, and now in September. So uh, historically, we've put a lot of winter irrigation water on to try to build up the soil profile. And then we just kind of uh, supplement that on a, on a slow feed basis, if you will. An orchard like this, he's about five years old. How long would you expect this to stay in productivity? Uh, there's ranches in Fresno that are in excess of 100 years old um, that are still producing, although they're in declining production. But I would expect this ranch to last at least 50 more years. Wow, that's incredible. Okay. Yeah. And um, when we start looking at the, uh, everybody knows the importance of bees to almonds. Mm -hmm. Now you, the pollination surfaces for figs are a little bit different to that. You want to talk on? Sure. Uh, Calamerna figs are the ones that need to be pollinated. Uh, they, there's a special tree that has figs that the, the seeds are actually not seeds, okay. but they're, they're uh, eggs that little wasps hatch, hatch out of and they have pollen on their bodies and, and they, they fly in and do the pollination. That's uh, that's unique to that variety. Virtually all the other varieties, though, are self-pollinating, okay. uh, just like grapes are. And uh, you, you don't need uh, any pollination, don't need any bees. They just take care of themselves. Wow, OK. Well, great. Let's uh, go actually see how these are actually packed and sent to the consumer. Sure, let's go do it. OK. okay. So we've come into the packing shed to see how we pack figs. And Kevin, talk a little bit about what makes that fig ready to go into this package. Well, uh, the figs come out of the field in buckets and we dump them into the trays here so we can sort out the uh, good fruit from the uh, fruit that's not good. And a, 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 a fig that's considered not to be good can have something like a uh, sunburn on it like this fig right here has. Okay. Uh, or it can be over, a little bit overripe and wouldn't make the trip. So, so we'll, we'll just throw those out and uh, all the ripe figs get put into different types of, of packages. This happens to be uh, a, a box that holds 12 one-pint strawberry baskets. Okay. And it, it's one of the older, uh, more traditional uh, boxes that we, we use. Uh, people like to, to go to the grocery store like a Whole Foods and they'll just buy an individual uh, strawberry basket this way. Uh, we have other packages that are anywhere from one and a half pounds uh, we have two pound clam shells that we do for some uh, chain store business uh, and the clam shells seems to be the, the new trendy way to go. Uh, the, the fruit is, is a little, it, it's, it's, it's just not quite so difficult to, to ship it and it, get, it arrives in better condition that way. This is the older style packaging that, uh, but it's still very popular and uh, you know people like them. Now we talk uh, the California fig. Figs pretty much all come from this region for the United States. Yes, and uh, I assume these figs are gonna end up all over the country and possibly even exported in some cases. We do some into uh, Mexico and we do a surprisingly large amount of our uh, volume into Canada. There's a lot of uh, uh, Europeans and Mediterranean cultures, especially in Toronto and Montreal and the French and the Italians. Uh, those folks really have a passion for fresh and dried figs. So we do a lot with them. Uh, but it's, it's pretty much all North American okay. consu consumption. Well, good. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. It's been quite the experience sure. learning how figs are grown, and we're actually off to the processing plant to see what dried figs are done. Great. Thank you. We've left the field now and moved over to Fig Garden Packing Inc., a processing plant for figs. With me, I have owner Michael Jura, Jr., Thanks for having us today. Thank you, Ryan. Glad you're here. Well, first off, you have a very long history in the fig business. Talk a little bit about your family and how you got started. Well, I'm third generation in the business. My grandfather started the business in 1946. Uh, in fact, we're in a building that he built then, back in 1946, that uh, you know, the family's been involved in the business ever since. Uh, my dad and uncles were involved in the business uh, from its inception up until about the late 90s, and then they got out, and my wife and I started the business in 2002. Well, let's talk about that process sure. that goes on for the fig. Um, obviously, we've seen it now in the field, and what happens to it once it arrives at your place here? Well, when we get the figs from the grower, we first have to go through a receiving process, which uh, they're inspected by the DFA of California for the California Fig Advisory Board. That's who's our regulatory agency. <laughs> Uh, they're really looking for internal defects. Uh, once they pass that inspection, 
Uh, then we would take them and keep them under fumigation, uh, cold storage, and size grade them, depending upon the varieties and the end, end uses that we would have. Uh, the size grading is done, they're stored, and then we process to order for customers. When that happens, let's talk, we've got multiple different products we produce. Bulk figs and package figs and also fig paste are the main products. Uh, processed figs, we put them in a hot water bath for approximately 8 to 10 minutes. Send the moistures up from approximately, when they come in from the field, at approximately 14-15% moisture up to 28-30% to moisture. From there, we treat them with potassium sorbate, which is a mold inhibitor. Uh, then they're sorted to get any blemishes, defects out. Uh, and then from there, they go to packaging, depending upon what customer, what package we're doing that day. Is it a bulk case? Is it a, a finger pack, a crown pack, a cup, whatever it may be. Now, I know figs typically will come off in a very short season, come later summertime. Um, when exactly, how long does the processing actually take for that? How long can you store those figs before they're processed? We actually process year-round and wow. package year-round. We have a deal with our customers that we've told them, and this is something that was instilled in me by my dad and my uncles, that we process everything to order. So we keep the figs stored in their natural condition before we get an order. When we get an order, then we process and package. And so generally, we operate on about a two-week lead time with our customers. And when we talk California figs, they basically end up all over the world. I'm assuming your products do the same. Yes, we ship currently, our largest market is of course the United States. We also ship into Canada, Japan, Hong Kong, Panama. Uh, that's pretty much our, our market territory. Good, and um, when you talked about the much different line of products, I mean, talk about some of the products that we may see on the store shelves that we could associate with this plant. Uh, primarily what you would see is uh, fig bars, uh, either in from a single manufacturer or from a branded manufacturer or a private label. Uh, fig paste would go into those products uh, and then the manufa cookie manufacturer would make a uh, jam uh, adding other ingredients that they would to make their, their flavor and what they want to achieve with their jam for their fig bar. Uh, the other thing is you would find uh, a lot of uh, our products in uh, grocery stores uh, across the country in uh, retail packages, uh, either in our label or in a private label. Uh, we do quite a bit of private label packaging uh, just because it, that's the way some of the stores are built and that's what they want. So Mike, this is a great example of a family operation. We've had your wife, Lisa, join us. Hi Lisa, there. yes. what is it like to work in a family operation like this? Well, you know, fortunately for us, we're both, we both come from family backgrounds, um, and both of us have third generation farming, uh, family farming businesses, and so this is just a continuation of a lifestyle that we've grown up with and understanding and knowing. So for us working together, we're used to that. Um, and we have children, and they're getting to the age where we're slowly but surely starting to bring them into the mix as well. So in fact, our daughter's in the office working right now. And so, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Not every couple can do it but we've managed to kind of work through it and, and um, we're here today, so doing good. Well, fantastic. I want to thank you guys for this tour and uh, really appreciate you showing me all about the processing of figs. Well, great, thank you thank for Thank you coming. very much. Thank you, you guys. guys. Very few crops have the rich history of the California fig, and to discuss some of that history, I have Elizabeth Lavelle, who's going to talk about it. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Ryan. We have covered a few different crops in history, but nothing like what we have today. Most people know about the fig gardens in Fresno. Well, we are going to go back and look at it, what, what it was like before it was even the fig garden. So here you have what used to be called the Bullard Lands. And here's an early airplane. This was probably taken about, oh, I don't know, maybe 1915 or so. And as you see, there is nothing. There's no irrigation, and there I are no trees. Yeah. There is nothing but ground. And actually it was called Hog Wallow. So about that time, 1910, 1912, an incredible man named Jesse Clayton Forkner, more commonly known as J.C. Forkner, came to the valley and he became friends with Pop Laval right away. Well, Jesse Clayton Forkner had this idea to take this hog wallow land and turn it into what he called a veritable garden of Eden. So how is he gonna do this? This is the actual shot of one of the dynamite blasts. It took over a pound of dynamite for each of the holes and they had an incredible number of holes that they had to blast. 
you could actually, by the time it was done, they could put a mule in it, it was so big, because the ground was so hard that they couldn't plant anything. So naturally people thought J.C. Forkner was crazy to do this, and he started this tilling process. Well, Henry Ford was so shocked that that happened that he actually came to Fresno, he drove his Tin Lizzie up to <laughs> Fresno to meet this crazy J.C. Forkner. So we have a couple more shots here of them working in the fields. You can see the small trees start to grow. At this time, usually from the planting, it took about three years before you got any fruit, which was not too bad. So then he had to try and get people to come and plant it and, and really harvest it. So he would hold these excursions with his wife. It's a very famous story about Luella Forkner. Her job was to feed them and make sure that they didn't talk to anybody else because if people got into town, they'd come from out of town. So if they got into town and they heard, this is crazy, this is hard land to, to, to uh, farm, they would leave. They would have this great, and this was an ad from the paper actually. They'd go, cars, they meant trolleys. They'd take the cars out to the Bullard lands, everything free, no obligation, light refreshments. And my always favorite is, the phone number was 268, two, six, eight, right? Yeah. Three digits. Yeah. So they would go out there and try and do that. They had offices, they mostly sold in 20 and 40 acre plots and people could turn a profit. It actually, for people that were coming from the Midwest and other places in the country, it was a pretty good deal. They actually could turn a profit before too long. But here, this photo, you can see, start to see some of the irrigation, which is really significant because as we saw at the beginning of the segment, there was just dry land. Yep. So anytime the photos here were showing there was water, and a lot of these pictures were used to get people to come and move to the area and plant this. As you see, like today, manual labor always, no machines involved. And here are some of the old days. These were just sheds built, not too unlike what we have today. And they bring the figs in. And again, they're all in, they're dressed up. Very nice dressed. They are. Yeah. And this wasn't just for Pop's photos. That is how they went to work. They figured their job was just as important as an office job. And it was because it was feeding the country. You can see that. And then, of course, the women always in their careful uniforms. You know, we wear hairnets today. Well, they had the whole garb. They had top to toe, hat to shoes. <laughs> it was all what you could wear into the packing facility. Then this picture is so much fun because it's actually a place that many people in Fresno know. If you look in this corner over here, you're actually going to see the Fig Garden Swim and Racket Club. So this is Moroa. This is Wishon. And this is actually a trolley. This trolley was built by J.C. Forkner to go all the way out to one of his developments on a place called Fresno Beach. And he would go into town, they had this desolate place, there was nothing around yet, one house, literally. It had a swimming pool, so it was pretty <laughs> fancy, but it was really only one house. So that's the trolley. This is actually J.C. Forkner's home that he built out on Forkner area. And it's not standing today, but it was beautiful and he was so proud of it. And here we have a place that many students had gone to, built for folks that were working in the area and for the new families that moved to the area. And we're gonna end this segment today with one of my very favorite pictures of Pops from all time. This is at the Roding Ranch. And Pop actually went out there, it was for an advertisement, and this is called the Children of Five Nations with their figs. So you have always the diversity of the valley was highlighted in Pop's photos as much as possible. And you just see the children, I love their happy faces. They definitely weren't working in the hot sun every day, but they're trying to show that this crop could go anywhere. And figs is definitely one of the most legacy crops that we have in the valley. Absolutely, it's fun to see. We've seen so many differences in some of the other shows versus yesteryear to today. That's right. But the fig industry, actually, there's a lot of similarities, and that's kind of the fun part of this history of the, of the California it fig. It is, and they don't really trellis the figs. You know, now they're such high tech for, for different crops, particularly yeah. grapes and other things that we have seen. but figs grow naturally. Yeah. They don't really prune out the, the different types. And now the biggest thing that we uh, heard about was the fact that they're using self-pollinating trees because originally George Roding figured out how to pollinate what became the Calamurna fig with a toothpick. <laughs> A little Talk bit about, of valley, yeah. colorful valley history. Yeah, exactly. From that. Talk about time consuming. Yes. So. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. This has been a great history segment on the California fig. We've seen them out in the field and we've seen them be in process, but it's my favorite part of the show. We've headed to the kitchen and we get to sample some figs. With me, I have Casey Pomerink of G Free Foodie, who's gonna give us ideas what to do with these great products. 
Casey, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, great. You got some examples of what we can do with figs and they look pretty complicated, but you're telling me it's pretty easy to do. So let's start over with this chicken here. This you have to try. This is Moroccan chicken and I've shared the recipe so people can go to the Valley Gold website and, and pick it up. But this is just some chicken tenders, tomato sauce, little peppers and onions. And you've got to give this a try because they get this dish gets its sweetness from dried figs. So those are dried black mission figs in there. And we actually got the seedies out in the field today, which is great. So I get to see, sample it in the in a dish here. So. And now you give it a try. Everyone knows that you can make a salad. Most people know you can, you know, wrap your figs with bacon and throw them under the broiler. But I think that there's some incredible savory applications for fig. Isn't that one of them? Isn't that, isn't that great? That's fantastic. Yeah, you can definitely taste that, taste that sweetness you were talking of. Absolutely. And this is just a pre-made pizza shell. Now I'm gluten-free, so this is a uh, <laughs> gluten-free one, of course. But just buy any pizza skin that you like. This is an easy, easy recipe. I've just got some caramelized onions. You can caramelize them yourself, which just takes, takes about 20 minutes. You just cook them down over low heat with a little bit of sugar, or you can buy caramelized onion or onion jam. Make it easy. Totally easy. So we're just gonna spread that over the par-baked shell. Okay. And then I've cut up some figs. These are tigers. I heard you saw these we earlier. We got the seeds out in the field. And these are absolutely gorgeous, the flavor and the color that they have. I love cooking with tigers because they're not quite as sweet and they're a little bit meaty. And they, of course, have all the fiber and calcium and everything that figs are known for, <laughs> one of the healthiest fruits in the world. So we're just gonna top those onions with those figs. And then I'm gonna take a little bit of goat cheese. Okay. Okay, some folks, you could use gorgonzola on this. You know where else this can go, Ryan? Your grill. Do you like to grill? Absolutely. So this is something that you could put on a grill pan or even right on the grill. Okay. But we're gonna pop it in the oven. And, and I it like, just looks like you kind of chunk it on there. Don't I'm just, have to get yeah, too... goat cheese, you don't have to get too specific with. You could use parm, you could use gorgonzola, whatever you wanna do. Okay. And okay. then I'm gonna finish it with a little bit of prosciutto. Okay. Okay. Somebody wanted to do vegetarian, they could just leave this off. If you're doing this with raw pizza dough, I would add the prosciutto after because it'll get tough if you do a long cook time. If you have time. to cook it too long, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. So how easy was that? Uh, it actually is very easy. Actually, it's, the onions probably were the more complicated part of the whole process. That's right, so. and you could buy those. This is going to go in the oven. Okay. And you just want to bake it according to the directions of the pizza um, shell that you bought. Okay, and that's so, it. So that's it. And then we're going to come right over here. This is one that I baked a little bit earlier. I'm going to finish it with some chopped basil. And you could do chives or something if you wanted okay. to. And I've got a little bit of, of good balsamic. So, so easy and really healthy. And this is one of those dishes that you can, I'm going to cut it for you. you got to try it, Great. right? I will have to. <laughs> So you'll know how you feel about fig pizza and gluten-free pizza crust all in one moment. Um, the fun part of this, actually, it looks like it could be used for dual purpose, either an appetizer or a main course. That's exactly right. And I do this sometimes as a flatbread if I'm having a lot of people and then I cut them in little thin strips. So go for it. Great. Thank you. Obviously, I have to get the big chunk of fig right of there. Of course so. you do. That's the best part. Absolutely incredible. So good, right? The figs are so diverse. I can't believe when I'm when I'm out cooking, people tell me they never tried it or they didn't really like dried figs and so they weren't what, sure. This is the first time I've ever tasted a fresh fig being cooked. And so the flavor of it is absolutely amazing. It's completely different than what you get with just the fresh fig by itself. So. It totally changes. Yeah. It totally does. I like to take them sometimes and slice them, put a little bit of sugar and brulee them. Okay. Like you, and you could do that in the broiler if you wanted to. So yeah, cook with figs. And we'll post these recipes and maybe even a couple more on your website. I'll be happy to share them. Well, perfect. So folks can find them themselves. Thank you so much for sharing this recipe. It is absolutely incredible. I cannot wait to go home and try that myself. And as well as I hope you're leaving the rest for me. Absolutely, <laughs> it's yours. I can't wait to come cook with you again. Well, thank you so much. I can't wait to have you back. We've seen everything figs today, from the field, to the processing, to the kitchen. And as you can see, the fig has played a very major role in the development of Central Valley agriculture. Whether it's fresh or dried, it's all a part of our Valley's Gold. Join me next time.
Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production of this program is made possible in part by a grant from E&J Gallo Winery.